Hey everybody and welcome to Facebook Live. This is the Deers Embroidery Legacy and I'm so happy you guys have uh, come to join us and uh, just give us some thumbs up, some hearts. We're happy you're here. Let us know where you're coming in from. Uh, I have Jennifer here. So Jennifer's in the house with me right now. And this is kind of a really special day because I got some new toys in here and it's gonna make me a little more proficient apparently but I have a magical button. I actually have a lapel on, so I'm able to talk and I'm able to you know, answer questions, do all that kind of stuff. And Jennifer has a lapel on as well. And the magical part of it is I control the mute button. So I can actually have her go live or not live. And it's yes, really, hold on, hold on. No, 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 don't talk Jennifer yet. Okay, now watch this. Say hi, Jennifer. No. <laughs> Okay, this is going to be so much fun, guys. So uh, where do we have people coming in from? You're live, Jennifer. People can hear every word you're saying. Oh, we have a whole scroll. We've got Indiana, Australia, New Jersey, Wisconsin, Idaho, uh, New Mexico, uh, Florida. So this is awesome. Massachusetts. Got... I can keep going. Keep going. So awesome. I, I really, really appreciate your, your joining us. I'm going to do my magic now, and I'm going to mute Jennifer. Watch this. Jennifer, say something now. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm going to be in big trouble. This is like uh, one of my, my biggest dreams come true. And I'm sure I'm going to be troubled trouble with a lot of you guys as well. But uh, we're going to have some fun. I'm going to be talking a little bit about auto digitizing. And it's a question that I've had come up for years and years and years because I, I know that they do seem like magical buttons. And a lot of times I've seen you know, software people sell the program based on those magical bells and whistles, you know, bring in a piece of artwork, click the button and voila, you have a design appear. And in the demos, it actually looks pretty good. I've even seen some samples so that and I, I know the machines are getting better, but there is a slight difference between something being done automatically and then something being done manually. And when you have, uh, you know, substandard results, generally you have to go in and you have to fix or edit those problems. So I, uh, knowing that this has sort of been a subject that people have asked me over and over and over again, I finally decided to do a little series and this is kind of the launch. So Facebook Live is the launch. I'm gonna give a little bit of a demonstration of, of auto digitizing so you get an idea. But we just did post a YouTube video that is on our channel. If you haven't subscribed, please go there and subscribe. If you have subscribed, give us a thumbs up and hope you're enjoying the content. But we just did a video that is actually a pretty simple design. And, and it was one that was sent into our Facebook group. If you're not a part of our groups, please join as well because you can answer any questions you want. And I do look every single day at the stuff coming in. And once in a while, I see a design come in and rather than try to write a response, because I know it's going to be way, way too long, I mean, a small book type of response, I know it's much easier to do a video because a video, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words. So I had this design come in here and I'll just show this up. Hopefully you can see it, but it is a pretty simple design. I know we can't get a close up, but the bottom one was auto digitized and it really doesn't look that clean. And I wanted to do a little video that showed bringing that image in with the exact artwork that the person used, seeing the results and then cleaning it up and making it look good. Well, I gotta you know, be honest here in that it would take me about 10 minutes to digitize this design. And, and I hesitate now when I say I gotta be honest because I did have somebody tell me that when I say I gotta be honest, it makes me sound dishonest, which I, I don't understand that 100% because I do try to be an honest person when I give my opinion on things and I try to be honest otherwise as well. But I honestly can say that would take me 10 minutes to digitize that design manually. I brought it into the software and it did it in a matter of seconds. So it beat me hands down as far as speed until I went in and looked at the design. And you will notice if you go and watch it, it is a 32 minute design of me basically tweaking buttons and icons and nodes, adjusting for push and pull compensation. So if you're into real theory and learning how to adjust this type of stuff, then watch the video, it's on YouTube, but I don't wanna bore you with, with the whole thing. Now it actually, uh, we had an email go out uh, today announcing that video on YouTube. And it said that this was the first of a three part series. A uh, little bit of change in that. I actually did the first video. I actually did the second video this morning and the second video ended up going 
uh, you know, on because there was actually two levels to it that I've, I've changed my mind. It's going to be a four part series. So we're going to have for four consecutive weeks, uh, complete overall descriptions of auto digitizing, when to use it, how to use it, the difference between raster and vector artwork, all that good stuff. So it'll answer all your questions. And then I'm going to have a full featured blog that's going to tie everything up together. So you want to get over and check those out because we do try really hard to give you guys great education to get you past the learning curve. Now I'm going to uh, bring up the software and show you a couple things. I want to give you a, a practical lesson of how to actually bring a design in and some of those buttons that you're going to press and every software program uh, pretty much out there does have an auto digitizing feature. I am going to be using Hatch. We are an official Hatch reseller. It's a Wilcom platform, so I've been using it for over three decades. I'm really familiar with it and it is great, but other software does have auto digitizing and it works under pretty much the same principles, except some programs do allow you to bring in what's called true vector images, vector art. That's going to be next week's YouTube video, just a little teaser. I'm going to bring in a true vector art object, which in uh, the Wilcom world, that is actually Corel Draw. It's a CDR file. Uh, I think that in like, you know, Floriani and some of those, they actually allow you to bring in a Illustrator file, an AI file, Adobe Illustrator. But the difference between those vector files and a raster or bitmap file is one is dots per inch, kind of like a stitch file. And the other one is object based, which means that the original nodes that created the design are actually there. And a lot of people would think that if you're getting really, really good artwork, like original artwork done in vector format, it should be much easier to digitize. You'll get better results, but that isn't always the case. And I'll explain why as we go into this four part series, I had to break it up because this would end up being like a probably two and a half hour video and none of you would want to sit through it. So I've broken it up into smaller bite sized chunks. So I'm gonna go into my software right now uh, give me a second. I just got to get my, my screen share up. I'm going to share my screen. And here I am in the uh, Hatch platform. And I'm going to go to my auto digitizing feature and I'm going to insert artwork. Now I'm going to bring in a rather simple piece of artwork. Uh, you know, generally you get better results with simple artwork. The more complex the artwork, the more you have to edit and the more you have to tweak the design. And this is next week's. This is going to be uh, one actually on doing a, a vector image, which this is a Corel Draw file. And then I'm going to do the same piece of artwork, but actually not using the Corel Draw. We're going to use a raster piece of artwork. And then the last week, we're going to do this image here, which is super detailed. And I'm going to show you the difference between the auto digitizing and manually digitizing that design. But for this example, I'm going to give you a very basic piece of artwork. This is our uh, embroidery legacy design. I'm going to call it up. And the first thing you want to do anytime you bring in any artwork is you want to resize it to the actual size of the design. I'm going to bring this one up to maybe 65 millimeters. And that's going to be the size of the design. So it's, you know, maybe uh, I guess what would that be actually if I do go over to inches because my mind still works in inches when it comes to a size of a design, but you do end up getting metric when you're talking about actual measurements for embroidery software. So this is about two and a half inches right now, which would be a, a you know, fine design for a small left chest or on the front of a hat, it would actually be probably almost perfect as far as size is concerned. So I'm going to click off of that. I'm going to hit the zero button. I love hotkeys, so that brings it up full screen. I'm going to go back to metric and then I'm going to go to my uh, selecting the object. When I selected the object, the auto digitizing tools came up. Now, this software does have a wizard, basically. It is a auto digitizing feature that will do instant auto digitizing. It doesn't give you any control what it sees it does. And sometimes it's just pretty much best to click that button and see what happens because surprisingly it can give you really good results. So I'm going to hit the auto digitizing and see what it comes up with. 
And there is the design. And I got to be honest, this is actually a bitmap image. It broke things apart actually almost perfectly. And I am pretty impressed at this point on how it actually did that design at a click of a button. So I'm going to look at this design and say that looks pretty good. But there is still a couple of little things that I would fix if I wanted this to be a quality design. Now, the first thing I want you to know is we have 5,186 stitches in this design. That's a stitch count. So somebody out there, remember that. Type it into the comments for me, 5,186. Because we're going to make some modifications and see how the stitch count is going to change on this design, I'm going to actually grab, let's turn off the true view for a second. I'm going to grab this first object, and that is the fill stitch, and just move it off for a second so we can Actually, let's get rid of that one. And then let's go here and let's hide this one. So I'm gonna hide the selected. Now here with this fill, you might notice that it carved out the object underneath. It didn't see it as a full fill. And that's one thing that I do let people know is when you do have a fill stitch and it's not a really big fill, a lot of people think that you're saving stitches by carving out the area underneath and you're reducing you know, density. But the reality is usually you end up adding stitches because of the penetrations and you end up changing the mapping of how that is going to sew because it basically has to go up and back and over to account for all of those holes that you've carved in the design. So I'm gonna hit the H key and the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab a bunch of these nodes and just start deleting them. And I'm gonna just delete those ones there. I'm gonna select these ones here and I'm gonna get rid of that object completely. I'm gonna grab these ones. Let's get rid of that one, come over here. And now I've deleted that object. Now, if you remember the first stitch count, I believe it was 5,186. I, I didn't write it down, but that's yep. what my memory, that's it. Okay, awesome. Oh, I need to turn Jennifer's mic back on. Jennifer spoke, I'm gonna turn her mic back on, but if she's not a good girl, I'm going to turn it off again. Did you hear me, Jennifer? <laughs> You're in trouble. <laughs> I'm in trouble. Oh, turning off. Okay, Jennifer can't talk now. See, see, this is how it works now. And I'm going to have way too much fun with this mic. Okay, let's turn it back. Do we have any like little happy faces or little anything going on, laughs or anything like that? Yeah, maybe a couple. Okay, your mic's back on now. You can say whatever you want, but be careful because I can mute anything you. Anything I want. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. Anyways, my stitch count actually went down to 4,665 stitches. So I actually saved a pile of stitches just by adjusting that and taking out all of those carving lines. And this is now going to sew out much better because if I start, let's say it's going on a baseball hat, I want it to start at one side and end up at the other. So it's just, uh, you know, so smoothly from the bottom part up to the top. Now, here's the next thing I'm going to do. I'm going to grab that object and I'm going to actually duplicate it. So I'm going to have two of them. Now I have two oblix, uh, objects on top of each other. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that second object and I'm going to turn it into an outline. And if I turn on my true view, you'll see that I have a running stitch around the outside. But I'm going to change that now to a satin stitch. And I'm going to tell it to be about two millimeters in width. And I'm going to leave it like that. I might have to go into that first object now and grab the points. Let's turn off the true view. And I might have to go in and start to adjust the push and pull. I might pull it out a little further on the edges. So it adjusts for that pull compensation. And if I wanted to get really, really technical, I would adjust the push. But I know this is going to be pretty good just by moving a couple of nodes. And that actually adjusts for the push and pull compensation on the design. And then I have that border around the outside, which I'm going to go to my effects. And I'm going to make sure that there is actually under stitching a edge run underlay. So I have an edge run, which will give me a nice smooth edge around that fill. And then I'm going to take that color that it dropped down and I did a satin stitch to and I'm going to move it up in the order and now I have a fill stitch with a border on it. That is going to look so much cleaner than a regular fill would. And it's just a matter of duplicating it, changing the stitch type, adjusting a few of the nodes, and then I'm ready to go. Now, this is the part that actually really impressed me because when I turn this lettering back on and I'm going to turn it on right here, let's uh, unhide all and I look at how it actually broke it apart. For the most part, it broke the lettering apart in a really 
nice way. It actually, you know, I, I'm actually surprised it did this because I thought I would have to go in and start to edit a lot of these objects and fix them up. So essentially, I have created a design, in my opinion, that is pretty much perfect for left chest on a baseball hat. And it's actually going to sew out really, really well. So that is done. Now here, my stitch count now is 5,717. It was 5,186 before, something like that. But anyways, I did add a little bit of stitches, but I saved stitches by taking out the carved holes, but I added stitches with the border to make sure that it was going to show up to be clean. So, you know, just, I'm, I'm more worried about quality than anything else. Add a few stitches, that's fine, but I want good quality results. Now I'm gonna do something a little different now. I'm gonna actually use a more complicated design and I'm going to do a small complicated. And this is where people run into problems because I'm gonna call up a new window and I'm going to go to insert artwork. And this time I'm going to actually bring in the design. I'm gonna to go to extra large here. I'm gonna bring in this one right here. And let's bring that in and click okay. Now I'm not gonna use the auto digitizing wizard this time. There's another tool here, which is auto digitize embroidery. And this will allow me to control this because right now this is a really big design. I'm gonna make it the same size I did before, which is 65 millimeters. So it's two and a half inches in width, bring it up to full screen. And now when I go to do the auto digitizing wizard, it's going to give me some options. And this is where I can go in and control the amount of colors that I see. I can control all of these objects and everything. And I'm going to let it digitize every color that I see there. And then, so seeing four colors, and then I'm gonna click okay. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm going to uh, have the choice of omitting colors, choosing fills or details. If I wanted to not have the white sew, I could go here and I could omit the white and that way it actually won't sew out the white. But I can also come here and I'm going to do that as a fill because I want a fill stitch behind there. But I can also adjust the sequence of the way it's going to sew. Because right now it's showing that it's going to do white first, then it's going to do the teal, then it's going to do the border around the fill, and then it's going to do the detail around the lettering. Now that doesn't make sense to me. I'd want to grab color number three and I want to move it up one in the order. So it does the fill and does the border right away, then does the lettering and then does the outlining. But one of my biggest issues is at this size, I know it's not going to have great results and I'll show you why. I'm going to click this. It's going to generate this entire object. Now, if I look here and it did resequence everything, so let's move that one, I guess, to the first part because I'm going to resequence it. So it's underneath the fill stitches there. It's done. I'm guessing if I were to go and, uh, you know, let's, uh, that I want to hide the unselected areas, I can see there the same thing happened. It ended up carving out those fills. So I'm going to hit the H key and I'm going to get rid of a whole bunch of those and just grab these here. Let's get rid of them and there's a tiny little piece there and I'm just going to take my box and grab those ones and I'm going to grab these ones over here and I got one more stranded little hole right there and there I've gotten rid of all my little holes and now I'm going to do a start at the bottom and a stop, stop at the top. So there's my first object done. Now that that one's done, I'm going to leave that one the way it is and then let's go to the next object and let's tell it to um, hide Let's see, uh, did it hide unselected. So let's go there. So now I'm going to grab that object. Now, here's the issue is if I look at this right now, this is like a one millimeter, maybe 1.25 millimeter satin stitch, which is way too small. But if I hit the H key, I can see that it actually did auto digitize it with points, counterpoints, and putting in angles. So for the only way for me to really adjust the width of that stitch, is to either go in and move all of those points out and try to be precise. And that is just way too much aggravation for me. So what I'm gonna do is kind of cheat the system a little bit. I'm gonna come right over here. And I think, where is that effect? Hold on, let me find it. Uh, I need to go right here to stitching. I'm gonna go to pull compensation. I'm gonna do, let's say, 0.9 millimeters of pull compensation. And now you can see it became thicker. 0.9 might've been a bit too much. Let's do 0.7. That's given me a throw of stitches from the, you know, the angle point that's going to exceed that. And then if I want to, instead of a center run, I will use an edge run. 
it won't be as close to the edge as I might like it, but it will be good enough. So I'm going to do an edge run underlay on that one. And now my second color is done. There's going to be two passes. Now, if I go to my next object and let's grab this one, I'm going to unhide all. And then I'm just going to grab that one and let's hide the unselected areas. It did do a pretty good job of outlining everything there again. But what I really don't like is the next color. And let's unhide all for a second. That little purple, purple border around the outside is just way too thin. We're talking a half a millimeter of stitches going back and forth, and it's just going to create a bulletproof mess. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to actually get rid of that completely. I'm going to actually, no, yeah, I'm going to get rid of it completely. So it is gone. Because I know if I want this to work out well, I'm going to need to put a running stitch border around it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually duplicate those objects and I'm going to change the color to another color like that. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into my edit objects and I'm going to start to break these apart. And if I look at this now, I'm going to break it apart once. I'm going to go to objects here. I can see that it's broken apart once. I'm going to break these apart until I can't break them apart anymore. Right now it shows that it's all broken apart. So now what I'm going to do is go to those objects and I'm going to grab, let's say the L and I'm going to highlight the L. I can see that it's highlighted there now. And I'm going to actually grab those three pieces and I'm going to weld them together into one piece. So I've literally welded it into one piece. And then what I'm going to do is turn it to an outline. So it's going to give me an outline around the outside. Now I have a running stitch outline. Then I can go to my digitizing tool and while it's selected, I can tell it to repeat. And now it's given me an outline with an outline. Now the outlines are always true to the artwork. So I want to leave those the same. I want to leave them exactly where they are. But where I really want to go in is I want to go into these objects here. And if I'm going to clean anything up, it's going to be having to go into let's say this object right here. And let's just get out of here right for a second. And I need to grab, oh, I can't actually edit it because I haven't broken it apart. So I'm going to break that object apart as well. I got to go back to either my uh, auto digitizing and actually it's not not a digitizing. It is in editing, edit objects. And I'm going to break that object apart. And now that it's broken apart into the three pieces, I could come in here, grab those objects. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab those two points and I'm going to move them in. And I'm going to grab then these two points right here and I'm going to hit the H key and I'm going to move them in. The reason why I want to move those in is if I have the uh, teal go all the way up to the border where the red is, you're going to have the teal sort of waterfall outside of the stitch that's going to line it up. So I have to basically pull my open end short. I'd have to do the same thing over here and grab these points. And I'm going to move these inside a little bit so that they are you know, pulled in. And I can actually see a little bit of a gap there, but then I'll grab these points here and you can see the blue water falling out of the edge there a little bit. As soon as I do this, it no longer water falls out and it looks perfect. So I would just then repeat the process around the outside of that E. I would take uh, all of these pieces that are individuals again right here. I'm going to grab them all. I'm going to do a you know, a uh, click and then I'm going to do a shift and grab all those pieces together. Then I'm going to weld them into one piece once they are welded uh, and it actually didn't weld one of them. I don't know why it didn't do that, but we will find out and let's just undo that. Everything was working so well. Okay, let's just grab the first one. Let's grab this one right here and let's now try to weld all of these together. And I found a little glitch in the software, which this does happen from time to time. So what I'm going to have to do now is go to outline and I will now have to go in and I have a little bit more editing that I'm going to have to do because I'm going to have to take a knife tool, break this apart or figure out where all of those problem areas right here just didn't connect and then weld them back together. But you get the idea for me to digitize this manually. I probably would have done it just as quickly and just as accurately doing it manually as I would doing it by auto digitizing. By the time I factor in all of that, um, you know, editing that is going to take place within a design, 
all of the extra steps. I really think it's almost a wash in a situation like that. And that was with easy artwork where you really get into the issues is when you're dealing with difficult designs, designs that have many, many layers on them. And that's the uh, next week's video when I talk about bringing in a Corel draw image. You have to remember that when an artist creates a design, they always will create the original artwork on layers. There's a base layer and they start building colors on top of each other. And they don't really have to take into account that a you know, thread on top of a thread on top of a thread on top of another thread creates a bulletproof design because ink on top of ink on top of ink doesn't really create hard ink. It's just still ink. So that's, that's kind of the issue is we are dealing with actual thread. And to translate that, I have met very, very few artists that actually know the, I guess, process of digitizing and will create designs specifically to work well when you hit that magical button. Now, here's a, a true story. Uh, many years ago, I did do a series, an educational series for a program that had just come out called Masterworks. Masterworks is no more, they've discontinued it, but we did the first educational uh, DVD series for that when it came out. It was, uh, you know, it was really long and they gave us a whole, I guess, list of things that they wanted to show. And one of the things they wanted me to show was auto digitizing. And I was like, oh, it, I, I kind of cringed a little bit because I did not want to be misleading to people. I didn't want to say, bring in any artwork, click a magical button and look at what you're gonna get because you don't get voila, you get voila. I mean, it's just, it's 90% of the time, it's, it's not that great. So what I had to do was create artwork that would actually hit that button and magically would work well. Now, the truth behind it is I had to spend more time with my artists getting them and teaching them how to create artwork that would actually transfer to embroidery well, then it would have taken me to digitize that design a hundred times. So it really is a catch 22. The, the main thing is with embroidery and with having good results when you're sewing designs, or even if you don't digitize, but you edit designs, you know when a design doesn't sew out well, is you have to go into your software, you have to identify the issue, and then you need to be equipped with the knowledge on how to fix it. That, that really is the goal as an embroiderer and you know to do some basic edit editing. If you want to digitize, then that's great because if you know how to edit, I got to be honest, you already know how to digitize. Now, did we have any questions come in, Jennifer? And you are still live. I've kept you live this entire time. Perfect. That's why I can't cough. Yeah, you can't, yeah. Jennifer drink. has terrible allergies this time of year, uh, so she has been holding in her cough. So, uh, did that's we have right. any questions? We have a few questions. Okay. Uh, one question is, why is the satin border an edge run underlay and not a center one? And what would be the difference? Why is the satin border a... An edge run? As That's far as... When you first had brought up the artwork? Uh, it depends. It will depend sometimes on the type of fabric. And this is specifically talking on Hatch because every software will react differently. Hatch does have what's called fabric assist, which means that you can bring up stretchy terry cloth as a fabric, or you can bring up, you know, leather or cotton as a fabric. And it will change the underlay values based on the width of the stitch, the density of the stitch, the pull comp on the stitch. So it might have chosen those values because of the fabric assist that I had chosen. That will change based on that tool. Next question. Okay, did you answer the difference between the two? The difference between the two? Mm -hmm. uh, an edge run on a wider satin stitch will generally give you a smoother edge on the stitches. Sometimes you'll see stitches on fills and stitches on loose knits and on PK knits where you'll see it sew out and it'll look a little sawtooth and almost like a jagged line. And you'll say, how come this stitching doesn't look as clean as other samples that I've seen? Well, it's the foundation, it's the underlay that actually gives you that break wall, that uh, you know, foundation where those stitches catch onto, they pull in, they hit the break wall and they give you a nice straight edge. So that's why I generally try to do that on most fabric types. Okay, uh, Michael was asking, does the pull comp add 0.9 to both sides or does it add uh, 0.45 to both sides? It'll add 0.9 to both sides from what I understand. 0.2 will add 0.2 millimeters on both sides. Keeping in mind if it is, uh, well, it obviously, whether you're using a 
point counterpoint, a classic satin, which means that like that turned it into a point counterpoint stitch. But in uh, Hatch and Wilcom, they also have an input C or a straight line, one path where you then can define the width of the stitch. That is a much safer way to go because it's gonna be perfect every time. And the underlay will always be perfect and the pull comp will be perfect. I kind of cheated the system based on what the software decided to do. Uh, so it, that might change. I, I always tell people, the rules for digitizing are there are no set rules. They change every single day in every design that you do. Okay, Next another question. Michael was asking, if you wanted to take a logo and put it on a 16 by 16 pillow, how big would he have to make the design in the software program? Uh, I generally tell people that you should always digitize your designs at the size that you want them to sew out. So I would bring in the artwork and resize it to the actual size that you want to digitize. The reason why is there are rules with regards to stitch lengths and stitch types. And those are all laid out in the foundational courses that we have. We have, you know, we have a, a cheat sheet that's free on our site as well that gives some of the general rules of stitch types. Uh, but when you take a design and you digitize it at the size that you want it to be, you know that you've taken into account all of those rules. When you start to increase and decrease the design, you might accidentally break those rules on the you know, one side of the scale, which is going smaller, or the other side, which is going longer. The rules can be broken and then you can have problems. Then you have the aspect of detail. Take a very detailed design that is digitized at a set size and make it smaller. And basically what you do is create a visual mess because you're cramming too much detail into a small area. Next question? No other questions. No other qu if there's yeah. any more questions, bring them in. This is, this is Jennifer has a mic, which is awesome. Now, well, I, my, Michael did say, would it not be easier just to digitize from scratch? Oh so. yeah, it would definitely be easier to digitize from scratch. I am all for manually digitizing. I like to show the auto process and, and I actually like, I gotta be honest, I'm doing a four part video series on auto digitizing, which I'm not a big fan of. So it, it makes me cringe a little bit because I'm sitting there moving nodes and editing stuff like crazy, but I wanna give people you know, who, who are just getting into this and they might have bought software because they think there's a magical solution. I wanna give them the reality of what they're going to need to do if they actually wanna get good results. And like I said, all artwork is different. You can have one piece of artwork where you click that button and it's not bad. It actually comes out halfway decent and there's not a lot of editing. And then you can have a really, you know, what you would perceive as a simple design like this one. And this took me like 45 minutes to actually digitize a little left chest design that would have, you know, taken me 10 minutes at the most to actually digitize manually. So you are 100% correct. Uh, learning how to do it manually is by far the better way to go. So, so maybe if anybody else thinks this has been helpful, Stacy says it's been very helpful awesome. for her. Yeah, any, give me some hearts, some thumbs up if this has been helpful. And again, uh, there is the first video that just went on to YouTube. There is three more that are gonna come up for the next three weeks. And then we're gonna have a full featured blog as well. Yes. Okay. One more question. Yep. Uh, why did you use the auto create outline and hatch? Why uh, the break apart and weld? Uh, well, those are just tools within the editing software. So when I, I, I did the auto digitizing because it is a tool that I wanted to show. I wouldn't normally do that. And then I tried to look for other ways to make things work because if I would have taken that, uh, I think it was purple, satin stitch outline that was around the E and the L, the teal E and the L, and I would have tried to convert that to a running stitch, it would have given me offset running stitches because the running stitches place on either side of that satin object. I wanted it to be right in the middle so it was nice and clean. So I needed to take those, you know, uh, let's say the L, which is three different parts. There's the top, there's the center, and there's the bottom. So those are three different objects, which I selected, welded them into one object so that I could take that one object, which is really the outline, and then convert it once to a running stitch, and then went into the software and did a backtrack because a running stitch generally always looks better when you have it go around twice. And that is also a safety measure because if a thread ever comes out, usually it comes out of the, the actual needle, the eye of the needle on the tie-in and when it starts to run. 
I've always tried to do double outlines using running stitches around details on objects because if you don't catch it and it still keeps going, odds are it won't look like a mistake if it goes around twice. But if it only goes around once and you don't catch it and then it comes off the machine and you take it out of the hoop and look at it and you say, oh man, there's three stitches missing then you're going to be in a world of trouble because you're going to be trying to sew them manually and get it fixed up. Cool. Yeah, awesome. I guess the only, uh, oh, somebody says, are there any sales for Black Friday? Oh, that is a really good question. Before we get to that, and I will answer that question uh, in one second, I'm going to bring up a couple of slides for you. Uh, number one, this one here, I did mention, and I'm going to try my, my magic here. I've, I have all kinds of new toys now, so we are really excited. We have uh, here our auto digitizing part one of four. So check out YouTube. If you're subscribed to YouTube, give us a thumbs up. We, we actually hit 26,000 people. Last time I think we did a Facebook Live, we just hit 25,000. So I'm just loving you guys because we went up like 1,200 people in a matter of uh, weeks, which is awesome. But uh, that is going to be on our YouTube and there will be a blog around it. So you want to make sure that you get that one. Uh, also, if you want to learn how to digitize, we do have our digitizing challenge, which is free on YouTube. Maria, this would be good for your question that you just put up. Okay. What's the best way to learn to oh, use the, the best program? Way to learn? Yeah. Awesome. So uh, the challenge is a free challenge. You get the software. It's a 30 day trial of Hatch and you get six different lessons that I take you through uh, digitizing a design manually. They are simplified because obviously, you know, I, I bring in the EMB file. I've actually brought in the artwork. I've set it up so that you're ready to go. I teach you the foundation and you create beautiful designs. And I, we've had tons of positive response from that. The next step up is our digitizing dream workshop. And that is a webinar based workshop. It is uh, reasonably priced. And actually, I'm just going to bring up the next slide here if I can. Let's see if my, oh yeah, it did work, okay. So the Virtual Digitizer's Dream Workshop is a three week webinar every Saturday and it's actually coming up on November 7th. So actually next Saturday, not this Saturday, but next Saturday, we have our webinar and then there is interactive lessons between each week that you complete. We have a Facebook group where we have ourselves and our admins come in and help you get past the learning curve and you use it within the free Hatch trial. If you have downloaded the Hatch trial in the past, Wilcom has graciously agreed to give us special codes that just for this workshop, you get a reactivation code and you can actually take it. This is a great way to actually get interactive education. I found the best way for people to learn is seeing and doing and to do it in the same software that the teacher or the educator is actually using. So that starts up next Saturday. There's still spots uh, that are available for that. So if you want to, James might be putting up a link uh, on, it's I up. guess it's up. Okay, mm -hmm. so you can, you can sign up there and I look forward to seeing a bunch of you uh, not this Saturday, but next Saturday. They are recorded. Even if you can't make the live webinar, you can actually watch them and we keep everything there for you for I think it's 30 days after the workshop ends so that you can view all the materials and the Facebook lot group, excuse me, the Facebook group will be active for the 30 days after it ends as well so that we'll help you with any questions even after the webinar ends. So then we do have our Digitizer's Dream course, which is the next step. And that is even more in depth. There's more exercises. Digitizing is all about repetition. It's about doing designs over and over and over again. And I can honestly tell you, and I'm saying this honestly, I've digitized over 100,000 designs in my career. I've lost count. And every design to me is still different. It's still a challenge. Obviously, I'm you know, trying to do more challenging stuff now in my career, but you never stop learning. And it's all about repetition and doing these over and over again. So those are the three uh, steps that we have. The uh, dream course is actually, it never expires, stays in your classroom forever. If you've taken the dream course, give us some thumbs up and let us know, because I do think that uh, our education is awesome. And it's because I was taught by incredible Shifley masters. And I was just blessed in my grandparents' factory to have learned from people who learned from people who learned from people. And it is an art that's been around for like a hundred and almost 50 years, mechanical digitizing, punching, they used to call it. So that's the other thing. Now, a couple more things and I'll let you guys go. 
Uh, if you didn't know about it, we're having a party and our party is actually starting on the 12th of November. We had our Halloween party. If you joined us for the Halloween party, give us a thumb up and some hearts and stuff. And we had a, we had a great time. And my whole idea behind this, actually, I'm going to see if I can switch this over. I'm going to, this is, I love all my toys. Now I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this and let's see what happens. Oh, the wrong one. Okay. Let me go back here. And man, I messed that up. Okay, here and here, yay, okay. Our uh, Christmas party is November 12th, 8 p.m. Again, if you can't make it, it will actually be there for you to watch afterwards. But the reason why we're doing this is we are giving people a bunch of designs. There's three in the hoop projects. You can see them there. There is actually a little five by seven Christmas stocking that has a zipper enclosure on the back and a little pocket where you can slide money and jewelry in if you're Jennifer. Uh, and then we have 3D, um, you know, tea lights and we have our, we, we just, and I'm doing a whole bunch of designs, but it is a very reasonably priced party where you will see how to do all of these steps. We'll give you the designs, we'll give you the tutorials, and we have a contest and we had incredible submissions on our Halloween contest, but we are doing a ugly sweater contest. And we've given you, I think it's 39 ugly sweater designs where the- Christmas sweater. What's that? Christmas, Christmas sweater. What's well, an ugly, okay. Ugly Christmas sweater, but you could wear it even if it's not Christmas. <laughs> Christmas in July. Yeah, Christmas in July, <laughs> Christmas in uh, you know November. Uh, but we are having a contest, uh, and you there's the, the guidelines and everything there. But we'll be giving away some great prizes, some great door prizes, and we have more parties that are actually going to be coming in the future as well. So we are just having lots and lots of fun with doing this. So. Uh, you can sign up for a Christmas party. James probably has that link there as well. And I am doing some really, really cool designs. I, I've uh, said to my, my kids, you might have met Jesse and James, and my daughter Beth is with us full time. Of course, Jennifer's in the business, but I've been busier and creating more designs and doing more work since uh, this pandemic started than I have in years. I was always traveling on the road. And I got to be honest, I am loving it. I am doing some incredibly detailed, realistic designs for this Christmas party that are, are optional if you want them and some other in the hoop projects that are just gonna blow you guys away. So we are just having so much fun with this. Uh, Jennifer, any more questions? If you guys enjoyed this Facebook Live, give me some thumbs up right now, you know, to tell your friends, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, we can't do this without your support. We do love what we do, but it's really good if people, it's really strange me staring into a camera, hoping that people are having a good time because I used to get in front of a crowd and you could actually see people. Uh, is there any? Mm -hmm. no? Yay, yes, okay, awesome. Yeah. And yeah. Jennifer sees them, so I'm... We have more questions uh, yep. about the digitizing, et cetera. So James has put the link up for awesome. people to view and also for the Christmas party, Perfect. all the details he's also put up as well for people awesome. to look at their leisure. And Carol was asking, no worries, Carol. I'll make sure John's got a comfy couch tonight. <laughs> Oh boy. Okay. Well, actually it's kind of funny and this, I'll leave you guys on this, but my wife and I, uh, we actually bought a uh, sofa set that actually is in our living room area. And we bought it because it kind of aesthetically looks beautiful. Like it just, it looks nice, but it's the most uncomfortable thing that I've ever sat in in my life. I got it. I mean, it's just like, it's almost like a, uh, torture apparatus after you've actually lived in it. So my wife and I went out and we bought a double recliner chair that we sit in now. And we just feel like this old- And you're not sleeping on that. <laughs> and, you know, I'm sleeping on that. That's where I'm sleeping. So I'm okay. Cause I got a recliner that I can cuddle up to. And my, my, uh, my German shepherd Daisy's over there. She'll show me some love. So <laughs> any other questions? Or are we good? Um, uh, I think that's it. Was there any Black Friday sales? We oh, I'm sorry. Black last. Friday. Okay. All I can say is that um, will come for Hatch. There will be some Black Friday sales for our products. So that's a given. We will put out our e-flyer and all that good stuff with letting you know of some things that we have for sale. Uh, but with regards to Hatch, traditionally, since Hatch has come into the market, they have always had a Black Friday sale. So it's a fairly safe assumption that yes, there will be a Black Friday sale. And I'm saying that now because if you do sign up for the Digitizers Dream Workshop, I will let everybody who's attending that know the same thing. 
but I'm going to have an extra special little bonus in there for you guys in the workshop, some of our stuff. We are the largest font developer in the world for ESA fonts, and we have education and stuff that my main goal as a software, um, I guess, reseller for any program would be that I want to make sure that people who buy the software actually get the resources and the tools to use it properly and to have fun using it and not be frustrated. So we will make sure we take good care of you. But yes, I am 99.999% positive that there will be a Black Friday sale coming up. Awesome. Thank you guys. This has been uh, awesome. And apparently Jennifer is saying we've got lots of hearts coming in. So I, uh, I'm having a great time. We'll, we'll try to schedule another one of these in the next week or two. I try not to do them too, too often because I'm afraid people will get sick of me, but uh, I appreciate you guys uh, signing in. And uh, again, go watch that video on YouTube. If it gets too dry for you, you can always fast forward uh, through it a little bit and see the finished results. James, would you mind just posting a link quickly um, for a time converter? Okay, a uh, time converter for the actual times that we have these posted. Yeah, we have people all over the world and they're okay. getting confused with which time. Which time zone. So yes, James will post a time converter. And keep in mind, if it isn't uh, you know, really friendly for you, we do make sure that we record all of the sessions and you can view them afterwards. Of course, it's better because we do have live questions, polling and everything if you can make the webinar. Uh, but we do make sure that if you do miss it for whatever reason, because this is a three week, you know, seminar, so three commitments, you might have something else coming up. Uh, you can go in and watch them later on. Are we good, Mrs. Deer? Good. Awesome. Blessing, guys. Stay safe. We appreciate you. And we just hope you have a wonderful weekend. And I'll see some of you guys uh, next Saturday. We're going to be starting the, the workshop. Awesome. Thank you. And I'm going to mute Jennifer first. Hold on. You ready, Jen? You are officially muted. Okay. <laughs> and now I'll mute myself.